Welcome to our Startup with Ferris live stream. Thank you for tuning in. Today's topic is on nine ways that your new business, your new services or consulting business can fail. This topic is dear near to my heart because I've had some successes in my, in my business life. I also had some, some issues, some, some ventured made it well, some didn't. And I also speak with a lot of entrepreneurs. On the average, I'm speaking to one or one to one to three entrepreneurs every week. And I hear their challenges. I hear their pitfalls. And my mission is to help you, the entrepreneur, the aspiring entrepreneur, to really maximize your chances of succeeding. No one can guarantee success. No matter what you hear online, what, what you read in books, no one can guarantee success. I can't guarantee success. But what we can guarantee is that if we learn from our own mistakes, from other people's mistakes, and, and try our best and give it all the effort and all the time that's required, I think we can maximize our chances of succeeding. And that's what we wanna talk about today, is those nine areas that I want you to avoid so you're more likely to not just establish a business, but also to grow it and make it very profitable. Some housekeeping items first. If you have any questions, any comments, we'd love to hear from you. I'd love, I'd love to hear about your small and big wins, your challenges, uh, or ideas or things maybe that you want me to address in a, in a future live stream or in a future video. So feel free to submit your comment in the comments below, or we do have a form uh, that you can submit questions for. The other thing is for those who are, who are watching live now, listening, or maybe later, um, again, participate. You can go to startupaffairs.com uh, and you can sign up with that, with our daily advisor. It's our newsletter dedicated to early stage new business owners in the services and consulting space. Um, when you sign up for that newsletter, you'll get our free e-guide on the nine ways why startups fail, which is what we'll be covering today. So with that introduction, let's, let's jump right in. Um, it is estimated that over a million new businesses start in the US every year. This is according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So we have this entrepreneurial spirit. A lot of us want to start new businesses and we do. So that's, that's great. On the other hand, if you look at other data, um, the failure rate for new businesses is high. Uh, some stats, again, according to the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, says it's 20% after the first year, 30% after the second year, up to 50%, 50% of businesses fail before they get or as they get to their fifth year. Other stats indicate a much higher failure rate, 80%. And I've read other and other stats, especially for product companies, maybe up to 95%. So, so failure rate is high. Uh, and, and I think you look at those averages, those numbers, there's always, you always have to look at averages and take it, take it with a grain of salt because there are different circumstances. Uh, but this is not the topic for today. The topic for today is how to avoid failing in this new business. So while this, these nine are, uh, this list is not exhaustive, uh, there, are other, there are other reasons why businesses fail, but I believe those nine cover most aspects. And if we get those nine right, I think you can deal with external factors that are outside of our control, uh, much, you will be in a much better situation. So let's, let's go through that list. The first one is, idea your idea your business idea is not vetted thoroughly and from what i've read and from my own experience and, and speaking with so many founders i think this is probably the number one reason why businesses fail so as founders or aspiring founders we're thinking about something all the time founders have a multitude of ideas great ideas and you know, ideas are a dime a dozen as they say uh, what typically happens is we get very excited about the idea. We might go and, and, and do some research on who else is offering the service we wanna offer, be it HR consulting, be it financial services, be it um, uh, lawn mowing services, sustainable lawn, lawn mowing services, whatever the service might be, we, we get very excited about it. And I think we also get excited about the aspect of that service that we're very good at. Uh, but we don't do enough vetting in general um, in terms of market research, in terms of really uh, niching down on the audience that's, gonna, that's going to need that service, uh, understanding what is it that they're not happy with today, 
Um, is it maybe maybe other people are offering the same service that you're offering, and maybe they're, it's too expensive, maybe the quality of that service is not where it needs to be, or maybe it takes a while for, for that service to be delivered. So, so vetting the idea when you go and do that market research and when you understand exactly what the pain points are of your target audience and really, really know what makes people tick in a sense and then offer, offer that service and package it in a way that would resonate with your target audience, you'd be, that would, that's part of the vetting we're talking about. And another thing is look at, for example, aside from the demographics of the audience and all that good stuff that we've covered in other videos, are you, for example, servicing, um, is it a B2C business to consumer? Is it a B2B service, you know, business to businesses, business to business? Uh, the, way, the way you sell, the way you package, the way you market a, a service to consumers is different than the way you do it with uh, business to business. So that, that's one thing to keep in mind. In addition, I think understanding the, com the competition really well, you don't want to mimic what the competitors are doing. I think a, a lot of ways, if you're starting a new service, uh, for example, let's say you, let's say you have a technical background and 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 you've moved into HR and you love that people side of things and and now you want to have an HR consulting company. You know that domain very well, but you what you might not know is that there are ten other people in your small town offering the same service. Or if you have to you have to happen happen to be living in a in a, in a larger city, there's a lot of online services. So understanding those, those competitors, and I think also not comparing to them because some of those competitors might have been around for five years, six years, seven years. So you're just starting. So it's good, it's important to understand the competitive landscape and see what services they offer, how they're packaging their services, how your competitors are, are marketing and promoting their services. That's good, but also part of the vetting is not to compare yourself to them and do exactly what they're doing. I think you first you first have to figure things out on your own. You have to sort of maybe understand the best practices and see what what customers are looking for. But if competitors are been around for a long time and they're not as responsive, maybe your unique value proposition, your UVP, is that you can deliver that service faster. If it's taken two days for your competitor to respond to an email and to and, and another week or two to respond with a proposal, you can be very agile. Um, you know, you don't have as, as many customers yet, but you don't have to tell your, your own client that, but you can be very responsive and respond right away and provide a proposal right away. You can maybe go on site and meet the client. So look, as you understand, as, as part of vetting the idea, this first point, very important point on why a lot of businesses fail is, is understanding, again, the competitive landscape and differentiating and, and then packaging and marketing the, the, the service that you offer in a way that that will make your idea, your service offering very, very unique. So that's, 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 those are some thoughts to keep in mind. Now, I'll give you another example. Um, if, if, you, if you have experience in one area and there's a, there's a trend out there and you wanna ride that wave, you wanna, you wanna be on, ahead of that trend because typically with trends, not, not just sort of fads, but things that are here to stay, usually they're business opportunities. Uh, with these new trends, emerging trends. So, so for example, let's say you're an accountant. Uh, you have accounting and accounting consultancy, and you're hearing about crypto, cryptocurrencies, and, and you're seeing. Let's say, let's say this was two years ago when when Bitcoin was at sixty thousand, sixty three thousand, I think the highest it hit. So, so you you think you can go, and there's a lot of a lot of buzz around crypto and people buying all sort of things. And this is before before maybe some of the some of the scandals that took place in the industry <laughs> but if you want to offer cryptocurrency tax consulting and you want to pivot your business your accounting business to support that you want to make sure you vet that space really well it is it there there is a benefit of being a first mover there's that first mover advantage that we talk about in business at the same time if something is very new sort of cutting edge in the case of crypto some of the legislative, some of, some of the just regulatory environment or, or the guidelines, they were not just, they were not set in Estonia. There's a lot of changes in, in that area. Also, it's that type of, you know, cutting edge technology um, is, is, is volatile. Uh, as we know, uh, Bitcoin went from 60,000 to, to 17,000. I think now it's hovering around 26, 27,000. 
So, so there was a lot of volatility in that space. So if you put all your eggs in that one crypto basket, you might have had a serious, um, you know, serious issue in terms of maybe cash flow and not having leads and clients. So again, in terms of vetting the idea, I'm all for being on the lookout for new trends, um, things that, again, you ride that wave, whatever, whatever that is in your industry, but do the proper vetting and make sure that, that maybe instead of pivoting 100% into this one area, you know, tip your toes in it, do a, few, do a few project, commit more resources as you see more revenue, I think you'll be in a better position uh, to, um, to, 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 you know, to do that proper vetting that we're talking about. So that's on number one, making sure that you vet your idea very well and thoroughly. Let me see if we have any questions. Hey, we don't have any questions yet, so, so feel free to jump in uh, to add, add your comments, ask your questions, your own experiences would love, would love to hear from you. So that is number one. Number two, in terms of the, the cause, the reason why businesses fail, is that efforts are underestimated. The effort to establish a business, to build, establish, grow the business is typically underestimated. You know, most of us, uh, you know, um, started our career in working for someone else eight to five or eight to six or whatever it is, right? Maybe we have to work two shifts if, if needed. Uh, but we're used to a certain mindset in terms of work. Uh, I think our ancestors, the cavemen, were entrepreneurs. They're, they're, they're scrappy. They had to make things work. But over time, we sort of, I think most of us lost that entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit. So, so I always say having your own business is great. I recommend that for, for people. But I also qualify that having your own business is not for everyone. As a matter of fact, I go out and say, I venture to say, having your own business is not for most people. So, but if you want to embark on this entrepreneurial journey, make sure you have a good understanding of what's involved. I'm not talking about the financial resources. That's important. I'm not talking about, again, vetting the idea we talked about it earlier or, or you know, how you market, how you sell. That, that's, these are all things you know, you'll learn, you'll have to learn to succeed. But understanding what it takes to build that business. See, there's a lot of things in business that you don't know. So you know, again, we're going to presume, presume that in a consulting and a services business, you know that domain that you operate in. You have some level of expertise, which is needed. It's required. People come to you because you're the consultant, you're the expert. But there are other things in business that you have to learn. Uh, you have to maybe learn how to set up a partnership agreement and uh, you have to get a lawyer involved. You, you have to learn how to work with a partner. You have, when you have your first hire or hires, how to manage people, um, sales, marketing, HR, you name it, uh, delivery, how to deliver a service. So, so there's a lot of efforts uh, involved in, in, and there's a lot of learning involved, which we'll get to in a second, but understanding what it takes is really important. So, so 40 hours a week is not going to cut it. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the number of hours that is going to be required for you to start a business, but all I can tell you, it might require 50, 60, sometimes 70 hours a week. And if you don't have that time and not just the, the actual you know, physical time to, to be working, but you also need to think about it like on your way to work, if, if you're not working from home or when you're doing your, your, your afternoon walk or your morning walk, that time you're thinking about how do I get leads? How do I deal with this issue? Uh, how do I deal with this competitor? This client is asking a question that I don't know the answer for. So in a way, you, you want to, you wanna, when you plant a seed, uh, it takes a lot of attention, a lot of care for, this, for the seed to grow and blossom. And, and the same thing with business. So, so understanding, I, I think, where people underestimate the effort is, I don't think they they they, um, they 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 have the I don't I don't think they understand exactly what it takes and the time commitment. So if you are in a stage in your life where you don't have that time commitment, you can't commit that time, then maybe this is not the time to start a business. If you have family issues, if you're taking care of young kids, or if you're um, taking care of aging parents, or you're going through some, let's say you're going through a divorce or, or maybe, uh, maybe even, even, even before you start your business, you need time to vet that idea as we discussed earlier. If you're very occupied and you're only spending 30, 
30 minutes here and there, that's just not going to fly. It's just not gonna, it's not gonna be ready enough for you to, to really establish that business. So keep these things in mind as you're, you know, as, as you're, before you take that leap, I think you can do things ahead of taking the leap uh, to make sure that you're making progress. So for example, maybe, maybe you wanna offer that service on the side, you know, you, you do you do a side hustle and we have a video on side hustles and, and my perspective on side hustles, but basically try it out maybe um, again on the weekends or after hours and see if you can commit an hour or two hours a day after your long day at work and after your family obligations or whatever other obligations you have. If you can, if you can commit the time, let's say for a month or two, that extra time aside from your daily job, I think that's a good sign that you can then commit, you know, additional time for starting a business. So all, all I'm saying here is that make sure you are ready for, for some unknowns, making sure you're ready to commit more time than, that, than you're used to, uh, because it's going to be on you, especially initially before you have your hires, before you have your, uh, someone helping you with sales or marketing, it's all on you and you have to figure it out. And that figuring out requires time. And, and I think in terms of another example that comes to mind, uh, if, if a friend of mine, they, they <clears throat> excuse me, let me get some water. They've been wanting to do, to start a business for, I don't know, for five, five, six, seven years. And, and every time, you know, I talk to them and I give them some ideas and then they finally decided to, to take that leap. And that's great. And, and then I think six, seven weeks into it, they weren't getting any traction. And um, they, they were really, really distraught and, and anxious and, and, and felt terrible that, oh my God, I just left my day job and I'm not sure what's gonna happen. And then when I sat down with them, you know, I noticed they're not doing the, they're busy with building the website, they're busy networking, they're busy, um, you know, trying to do some, some marketing effort, which is great. But when they had leads, they were taking their, their time to respond to them. You know, they were busy with these other things, uh, you know, through, you know their, during their day. And, and they're not sending the proposals on time. They're not following up with the leads on time. Because, you know, they're thinking, I'm working 8 to 5 and after 5, you know, I'll, I'll do the proposal next day. That doesn't work. I mean, you will initially, you have to put in the time uh, to be very responsive. Uh, to your to your to your clients to be very responsive to you know uh, going going to maybe events in the morning events in the in the afternoon going to events at night again I'm not saying that you drop everything in your life and just to do that business there there is you have to have a quality time for yourself for your family you have to meet some obligations but you have to give up on certain on other things maybe some leisure time maybe some TV time whatever whatever it is you know for everyone is it's different but you have to put the time that is required to get that business to grow. Let me see if we have any questions. So we have a comment from Jason. Jason, thank you percent. He, uh, thank you, Jason, 100%, he 100% agrees. And, and Jason is, I don't know, I've, I've probably known Jason for now over 15 years and I know, um, uh, and, and he's a friend, he's a, he's, 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 uh, he's a partner, we've, we've done some business together. And I know when he commits to send a proposal, even if, and, and now he's gone through some, um, uh, some challenges um, uh, in, in, in his personal life. Oh, good. He's, he's a great guy. Sorry, sorry, Jason. But I want to give you an example. He did send the proposal on time. And it was an amazing proposal with actually a video on, on, on going, going, going over that proposal. So not only he delivered on time, but also he, it was very well packaged. So if you want to get clients, if you want to take care of your clients, sometimes things happen at home or at business or whatever the case might be, but you still, you still, you know, do it on the weekend or after hours to meet your obligations. So sorry about all these details, Jason, but I appreciate your comment. We do have a question here. Do you recommend a B2B or a B2C business model? Which is more likely to succeed? B2B or B2C? I mean, I don't know if, there might be some data on this that I don't know about. Um, it'd be good to research if there's a different success rate between B2C or B2B businesses. Uh, but it's really going to depend on, on, on your expertise, right? So if you're offering, uh, let's say, let's say the, 
um, the example I mentioned earlier, the uh, lawn mowing services. Let's say you have this the sustainable uh, uh, lawn mowing services. Uh, would that be better for a B2C or a B, B2B? I think if you've never sold this, this is if you, if you have if you have experience in selling to businesses, I would say start with that. If you have experience experience selling to, to consumers, start with that. So I think it's a more of a function. It's more of a of a function of your experience, or maybe you have you have a business partner, or maybe you're first hire the salesperson. They've done B2B. That that's what they've done because selling selling B2B. Is, is different there there's um, you know if, if you're selling if I'm, I'm the uh, homeowner you come to me or maybe i get your flyer and i call you you know i'm going to make the decision right away maybe check with my my spouse and, and and we make a decision right but for businesses it's a different sales cycle it's a different marketing cycle how do you get into that company and then maybe they're different decision makers so i think it's a function of 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 your expertise and maybe the if you have a team a salesperson or your business partner if you have more more um, you know, more experience selling to consumers, I think go that route. And I think the other thing, if, if, if you don't have experience selling to either, uh, look at the opportunity when you're vetting the opportunity uh, or you're vetting the idea, look at, uh, look at where maybe there are more opportunities. If, for example, again, uh, companies are, um, let's say you're, you're an area where there are an aging population and that aging population you know, typically they've they've saved some money over their years, and now they're looking for financial planners, <clears throat> excuse me, to help them through their, you know, their golden ages. So so potentially, instead of going and trying to sell that financial services to to individuals, maybe you can go and work with. Uh, my my wife was a teacher, and maybe you can go work with the school district. And if you can, this is B two B now, and if you offer and you convince them. That you are the person, the the consult, the financial advisor to work with, maybe they would have you as an approved vendor, and then all these uh, teachers who are now about to retire, they can come to you because you're recommended by the uh, by the by the school school district. Uh, this is just an example. So so I think looking at your expertise in terms of whether you have expertise in selling to B two C or B two B, and also the opportunity in sell itself. And then you can, all this stuff is learnable. You can, you can learn how to, how to sell the business and how to sell the individual. So, all right, let's see. And Jason said, no problem. Okay, sorry if I went into a lot of details, but if you are looking for a great web development, web design um, and SEO services, let me know. Um, I will send you Jason's way. And again, there's no no affiliate programming here. This is all just helping helping uh, helping Jason out because he's a great great guy. Um, I don't get get a kick out of that, but um, he's a great guy. So thanks again for tuning in, Jason. All right. Uh, so the third reason why businesses fail, and again, we're, we're most of the examples and most of what I'm describing here are about services and and consulting. But if you happen to be dialing in. And let's say you have a product startup, or you're you know you're not in services and consulting. Maybe you're in retail. A lot of these ideas still apply, but our focus at Startup with Ferris is on new business owners, people who have an idea or they started and they're struggling. So we want to help them expand, you know, establish themselves, expand and grow. So the third reason is not enough planning, insufficient planning, and that is very common. I speak with founders. And where's your business plan? Mm, okay, um, okay, you know, no, no business plan. Well, I've thought about this. Oh, I've been thinking about it for six months. I mean, I love the idea of ready, fire, aim. That's just startup. That's 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 just how things work in a startup environment. Uh, but you can't do that all the time, and you still have to adjust. Even even with you know, sort of ready, fire, aim. Over time, you have to adjust. So so I think. It's very important to document what you're doing, especially if you if, if you haven't started yet, if you're vetting the idea and you're not sure, start writing down the thoughts, the ideas, the results of the the results of the research you're doing. And and we do have a we have a we do have a series, a playlist on on business planning. So check those out when you have a, when you have a minute, and we'll add this in, in the description after after the live stream. But it's important to document. Uh, you, you, you can you can go and, and talk to three competitors and, and and after that you know you'll forget and, and what did he say what did she say you can go and do um, some more market research 
you can you can look at the websites of, of other people start documenting this and start adding more details and start having questions on what you're documenting now people ask a lot of questions about business planning oh i've never done any business planning okay well go on youtube there are a whole lot of videos on this watch you know spend two hours and and i mean that's the commitment to do the business you have to learn all these things that you you've never you've never done before <clears throat> excuse me so so writing that business plan and starting section by section is important and then at times the question i get is do i need to get a professional to help me with this i'm of the opinion of start learn on your own in every aspect of the business you're not going to be a cfo you're not going to be a top marketer you, you, you could be you're not going to be a top salesperson you're not going to be a top hr person i mean as a business owner you have to know all of these things uh, you have to have a certain level of knowledge you don't have to be an expert in each one of them so same thing with business planning every section of that business plan you, you have to understand a little bit about marketing a little bit about sales a little bit about hr a little bit about packaging and delivering the service so do that on your own first and maybe in specific sections you can go and hire a a consultant someone who does this to help you fill in some gaps that you're totally you know unaware of so i would say my approach is start writing as you're doing your vetting your research or even if you're two three years in the business and now you want to really expand the business write a business plan for that next phase of the business and then in specific areas where you're not comfortable you know you've, you've watched things on youtube you're still not sure hire someone to help you in those specific areas but i wouldn't go and spend ten thousand dollars on someone to write a business plan for you that would not be what i would recommend later there are cases where that makes sense i think after you've maybe you have some real life data if you after you've done a bit of implementation of your service after you've grown the business just a little bit i think it's totally okay and and now maybe you have an investor and you want to you want to just pop you want to have something that's complete comprehensive polished because you're going to ask for even more money maybe maybe you need a, a full 50 page business plan that's i'm not opposed to that but initially i would say do it do it on your own and and here here's an example of of where someone a small small business owner someone who has a long career in higher ed and they had a knack for fashion they 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 loved um they loved fashion all aspects of fashion i won't go into into the details and and after many years they decided to take the leap and, and 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 do this and 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 again it's good it's good to have the passion it's important the skills are are in my mind more important so so just by by them being be known by their friends that they're into fashion they, they got leased right away when they start to put on their own social media that hey i'm starting this business they, they got leads right away but unfortunately those leads dried out dried up uh, and and they're, they're they weren't sure what, what's going on and then when i looked at at their marketing material their website their uh, instagram their landing page uh, landing pages their their linkedin profile i mean they left all of that they left much to be desired so they're in fashion you know they're in this sort of creative the, you know the aesthetics are important and when you're marketing uh, marketing your content your, your your the picture that you use the videos that you have just the, the the copy the text that you have on your website on your LinkedIn profile on Instagram if it is not gonna if not going to have the that's you know that that touch of creativity of professionalism you're not gonna get leads especially if, if you're in that space where you have to be very creative so so they did a lot of things right um, in terms of uh, in terms of in terms of reach, reaching out to their network and getting those initial set of leads but if you don't have a if, if if you did not plan for marketing if you did not and that that was the issue with them is they really didn't have any you know any marketing plans or, or any any even not even plans like specific basic i would say the basic the fundamentals of marketing they didn't have a grasp of that and that showed in the market that they were doing and that's really impacted their ability to kick off that business hopefully after the session we had with them and i gave them some specific tips and sometimes you go you have to go and hire someone to help you in some of those areas uh they'll, they'll be doing better in the future so so that again not plan not enough planning 
is is one of the reasons. And I want to counter that. The other side of that coin is um, too much planning. Uh, and before we go into this point number four, um, again, I want to remind you that we do have the Daily Advisor. It's the newsletter dedicated to early stage founders, early stage new business owners, and the services and consulting business so, so businesses. So we cover, uh, we share some of our videos. We we have uh, articles on on every aspect of the business. So do sign up. Uh, again, it's free for now. We don't we don't sell any services. We're not monetizing yet. Our number one priority at this point is to build a community. So we'd love for you to to go and check out the new the the, the daily advisor. And, and come back to us with questions. If, if you have a topic on your mind or you're going through a challenge um, that, that you just don't have an answer for uh, or you're confused or you're hearing different opinions, feel free to reach out. We'd be more than happy uh, to answer those. So back to our point. So the fourth reason why businesses, new businesses fail is that too much planning. So I just spoke about, spent five minutes talking about planning, planning, planning. At the same time, I want you to be out there hitting the pavement, knocking on doors, knocking, you know, virtually, you know, actually knocking on it in that literal sense, which I did for a long time when we were uh, on our first start startup, going to door to door trying to sell folks websites. That was back in 2003 where websites were, oh my God, what's a website? So, so knocking on doors, hitting the pavement is important. And I think the issue that some founders, uh, face is that they might be very good in one area of the business. So let's say you're very good with, with Excel and with, with financials and with numbers. And, and that happened to me with, 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 with one of my early ventures is my, my business partner and I, we sat down and you know we spent two, three weeks perfecting this financial model and perfecting uh, the sales forecast and perfecting, oh my goodness, you know how many leads are we going to get from which marketing campaign? And what is, what is the conversion rate from from an encounter to a lead, from a lead to a qualified lead, from a qualified lead to, uh, to a prospect, from a prospect to a customer. And then is this customer going to buy from us? And we spent so much time uh, building up this crazy Excel spreadsheet with all these formula. And then, and I think that was, that was, that was good to have, but it was at the expense of doing important things to build a business. And part of it, I think, is and maybe maybe that was sort of some sort of maybe internal bias is like the things that we're very good at, maybe maybe that was sort of the the path of east resistance. We convince ourselves subconsciously that we're busy in this new business and we're avoiding the difficult things. In that specific example, the difficult thing was to go and literally knock on doors and tell people, "Hey, I have the service. Do you want to buy it?" Right, and convince people to buy what I was offering. So. So I, I, I want to cautious founders. I, I do want you to plan, but I, I love what Steve Jobs once said. He said when he was he's talking about hiring people, he said, and I think this applies to entrepreneurs, he said, he said we hire thinker doers, people who think and do. So if you're the type, especially if you're the type of the strategist, you know, you think about the vision and the strategy and the big picture, that is important. You need that for the for business. But at the same time, you got to put pen to paper. You got to, and maybe you get your co-founder or co-founders or your first hire, or again, a friend who's good in, in operations maybe and sit down with them and make sure that you're not just planning and focusing a lot of time on things that you're, you're good with, you're good at and things that you're comfortable with, but you're also addressing other sides of it. So, so the point here is that um, don't spend too much time in theory uh, put some time in it, and then and then you can. In, in, I'm in Silicon Valley, and you hear this this idea of of you know an alpha and a beta release of a product. And Google is very famous for that. When they launched Gmail way back then, I think for five years Gmail was in beta. So so it's okay to to have an idea, to to have some thoughts on how to package it, how to price it, how to sell. It. Go out and try that, and then based on the feedback you're getting from the clients, then then. Or, or you know, even when you're pitching and you're not getting clients, get that feedback on what's working, what's not working, and then put that into your plan. An example here is someone who reached out to us actually on, on Ask Ferris. We have an Ask Ferris form for, for entrepreneurs to, again, free, no charge. Um, if they have a question or, you know, I offer 30-minute 30, 30 sessions. 
and and he you know we talked and he's in the medical profession and and he set up a business uh, in addition to his medical practice where he would offer some some sort of remote consultation so it's great i think i, I told him you know make sure you have the idea and and he, he you know in terms of what he's offering it sounded like he's done a good job vetting the idea now that service required a lot of information gathering uh, from from the patients so what he wanted to do is to build this massive online portal this website where he can gather all that information a whole lot of a whole lot of fields a lot of a lot of things that people have to upload their medical record and obviously all of that has to be done in in a health privacy you know with the health privacy guidelines in in mind so i advised him not to build this portal I said, building a portal, and he's not technical. He's a great doctor, very established, but he's not technical. And he doesn't know anything about online portals. I said, why don't you do something manual? Uh, find someone, hire someone who can do like a, a 30 minute intake call. They can get all that information. Maybe they email you that information. You know, the clients, you can find a secure service, but don't spend months of building this portal and you're not sure if this is going to take off or not. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't listen. I, again, I'm not saying that people have to listen to everything I say, or, or everything I say is 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 going to work. But there's some key business principles, and I think people get excited about their idea. They're, they get excited about the business, and they think they can make it work. Well, just like gravity, you you know you can't defy gravity. Gravity. It it just you know if, if I drop this cup here, it's just if I let it go, it's going to drop. Same thing in business. If you have, uh, you know, if you don't follow these principles, it's just things are not going to work out. So, so the idea back to the example is he, this this entrepreneur, eager to get something going, he built this. He spent ten months building this portal, and, and then it didn't work out. It was just too. The user experience was awful. It was too difficult for people. He's dealing with an aging population. I'm, I'm not stereotyping or anything, but. The folks, the, the, the population he was working with wasn't as tech savvy, so that didn't work out. So, so again, um, sometimes too much theory, sometimes thinking that you have an idea and 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 I I, I want to sort of do something without getting feedback from from the market and from your target audience could backfire. So keep that in mind. Let's see if we have some comments here. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. I don't see. Yeah, we have a question. So, how do I strike the right balance between under planning and over planning? I'm not sure. I think this comes with experience. Uh, you know, it's, we're not born with, with 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 a lot of these skills that are required to build and grow a business. So, um, I think if you're finding yourself, it's it's. It's for, for me, like I said, I learned from my own mistakes and, you know, talking to others. So that's one example I mentioned where we spent weeks perfecting that financial plan and the financial projection in the next business. Uh, we didn't do that. Right. Um, and I'll talk about other things where, you know, you, you learn from your own mistakes. And I think uh, I would say go to a business plan again watch our video or other videos on business planning. And let's say there are like seven, eight sections, sales, marketing you know, organizing the company, delivery, all of that market research and, and, and have a cut, you know, have a first cut. It doesn't have to be 30, 40, 50 pages. Maybe, maybe start to say, okay, it's going to be 10 pages. Right. And then start to, to, to go out to the market, um, try something out again, if you're doing maybe freelancing, if you're talking to others. So, so I think do, do a little bit of it, try it out and then and then improve based on on what you've learned and if you haven't done any of this it's going to be very hard if you're just starting a business then you're starting from scratch but there's a lot of there are a lot of resources online and believe me believe it or not your network is is very valuable and i think your network is probably one of the most underutilized resources that you have at your fingertips people most people love to help others so so don't be don't be hesitant to reach out to folks might be more difficult for some of us than others we have egos what what have you but but i i mean and part of why we started the startup with ferris and and we do a lot of these things at no charge is because a lot of people helped me when when i was struggling a lot of people 
came in and provide, provided amazing advice that, that saved the day for me. So I think leverage your network, do some planning, um, develop that first cut of the business plan, go and talk to others, and then and then go and implement and come back and maybe enhance the plan. So not sure if this is this is a good answer, but I think it comes with experience and and, and then you'll find that 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 good balance. Moving on. Item number five, the fifth reason why businesses fail. Now this one and the next one <laughs> have a lot of scars to prove. So not working with a lawyer, you know, improper legal support believe it or not, is a reason, a, 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 a maybe not talked about enough, but it is, I've seen it, again, with, with some of my ventures, with others, if you don't get the right, proper, adequate legal support, you'll run into major issues that could bring your business down. And I know attorneys are expensive. Um, I don't know. It could be 215 an hour, it could be 315 an hour, it could be 495 an hour, it could, it could be 750 an hour, depending on what you're looking for and where you are in what market. But do not go cheap on attorneys. Initially, before you start the business, you got to set up your, your corporation, that legal entity, whether it's an S Corp, a C Corp, an LLC. You know, I'm not an expert in any of this stuff, but, but you, you, you got you to gotta go. And you can go online and maybe do, use one of those online services. That might be okay, but but I would say speaking, finding first, finding an attorney who works with with businesses like you, like your, your size and maybe a little bit larger, uh, someone who who knows your industry because there's some legal considerations specific, you know, to industry. If you're health in the healthcare uh, in the healthcare vertical, there are privacy considerations and, and whatnot. So so finding that lawyer and establish a plan on using them at different junctures of, of, of your business. So for example, initially, again, that, that, that initial entity that you want to set up. Second, if you happen to have a business partner or business partners, you definitely want to get a lawyer involved. I've seen it where best friends, those who've been together for, I don't know, um, sometimes family members, right? Years together and, and everybody knows every, everyone really well. The trust level is high. Just, just a few months into the, just a few months of the business and then, and then they're suing each other. I'm not making this stuff up. I've seen it where partners after two, three years and they're good friends and everything was going well, but something happens with one of the partners. They don't want to be in this business anymore. They have stuff going on at home or they're just sick and tired of this or maybe they inherited something and they don't work anymore whatever the case might be or they're sick and tired of of working you know 10 12 hours a day and they want to go back to corporate so these things will happen and if you don't have the partnership agreement in place well documented identifying all the potential issues that could come up and then how to resolve them if you don't have that in place it's a formula for, 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 for failure. You also need contracts with your employees, uh, your offer letters, and, and even just, just um, your non-disclosure agreements and non-confidentiality agreements. When you start having customers, you have a contract you want your customers to sign. If you work with mid-size and, and larger businesses, they have their own contracts that you want your lawyer to review. And I have so many stories, so many examples. Maybe, maybe we'll do a live stream on that in the future but a good lawyer will look at these contracts and make sure they're customized for you. So we can go online right now, I'll search on Google and you'll find examples and you'll have templates for every other contract that you're looking for, vendor, partnership, you name it. I would advise, advise against using those templates. Make sure you have a lawyer, go to a lawyer with a template. And again, if you have the time, in my mind, you should put your time into selling into servicing the customers, into growing the business, and make sure you budget it sometime for, for, for legal legal cost. So it's okay to look at these templates, understand, you know, watch YouTube, understand the, the key elements of these of these contracts, and then go go to a lawyer and you'll be much more educated and you can have a more meaningful conversation with them. That's totally okay. And that might save save you a little bit of time and money with the lawyer. But do go to them for all these types of contracts. Now, 
a pro tip here is that as you're working with contract with lawyers also, especially with uh, contracts with with vendor uh, with customers uh, and with vendors, that typically there are sections about liabilities and insurance requirements. So especially if you're working, starting to work with larger companies, these larger companies want full protection. So they have sometimes, I think, unreasonable, at least on, on the receiving end, uh, limits for for these insurance for these for these coverages. So they might ask for twenty million dollars for like general liability um, insurance. They might ask you for five five million dollar limit for um, cybersecurity, you know, coverage. A good lawyer and maybe an insurance good insurance agent could help you negotiate this with with this with the with the client. And the important part here, if cash is tight, which is typically the case, you'll be paying less insurance premium if you're looking for a five million dollar coverage versus a twenty million dollar coverage, right? So so again, good lawyers they'll be your business part. They'll be good partners for you on the long run. They'll cost you a little bit initially, but they'll pay off in the future. So many examples. I think we'll talk about this later. And if you have, again, if you have, if you have any questions about working with lawyers, send us send us a question on startupaffairs.com or or leave us a comment here. And again, a disclaimer: I'm not a lawyer. This is not a legal advice. But um, you know, everything you're listening to here uh, at your own risk. All right. This is a good advice from my friend Dan, who's been um, who's been my lawyer for for over 20 years and a good friend now. So that was on on. Number five, I'm not working, not working with lawyers or not having the proper legal support. In the same breath, I would say that on the same type of, of relying on professionals, the sixth reason why, why businesses, new businesses fail or they struggle and don't reach their potential is not working with an accounting professional. Again, improper accounting support. And have many scars here. And I have a, again, we have another playlist on, on accounting. And you'll see in all these videos, I think I'll, do not do accounting on your own. That is my sincere advice to, to, to owners. And I, I say that not only to early stage, early stage business owners, uh, but even for those of us who've been around for, for a number of years, if you're spending a lot of time on accounting, you are not spending time growing the business. So, um, there's a lot of aspects to accounting. There is bookkeeping. There is uh, a certified, uh, like a CPA who would help you maybe with your taxes. And there's like a director of finance or like a chief financial officer, a CFO. You don't need all of that when you start the business. But as soon, and initially, maybe the first few months, if you don't have any employees yet, you don't have any clients yet, but maybe you have some business expenses. So have a, have a spreadsheet, a Google sheet, an Excel sheet, and start tracking everything you spend on the business there's some tax benefits for that actually as well even if you haven't formed your llc yet um track that so that's okay to have have your own expenses in a spreadsheet but as soon as you start to hire people as soon as you started start to have customers and and, and you're paying invoices go go out and find a bookkeeper uh, it's going to cost you i don't know a couple hundred a couple hundred bucks a month, 300 bucks a month, it's worth every penny. Because later, when you are, when you are, um, if you want to sell the business, and I'll, I'll talk about that later, uh, but but as you start having more clients and as you start to have having more bills and more invoices to send, if all of that is something you're managing in your head, and I don't know the number, I mean, so many founders I speak with, they still do that to date. I spoke with a friend of mine who has been in business for over 15 years and he, he works with his business model is um, quantity. He makes like a hundred bucks from a client or $150 a month, but he has hundreds of them and he's very, he's doing very well. And I was surprised to know that to date he's, he's still doing his own accounting. And I, when I talked to him, I said, my friend, someone gave me this advice. And it was probably one of the best pieces of advice I got in my in my business career. They told me outsource that headache, even if you're good with numbers, even if you're good with spreadsheets. It it just tracking hundreds of clients and who to invoice and who to collect. And this guy didn't pay me, and this gal did not pay me, and and I'm late on paying my credit card. Um, 
you know, bill. And now I have to call him and say, hey, I'll, you know, waive the fee. I'm going to pay you the whole amount tomorrow. Like all of these things are occupying your mind. <clears throat> and you should be obsessed and occupied by growing the business, not by worrying about which invoice to pay and which bill, you know, which invoice to send and which, which, which bill to pay. So um, as the business grows, and again, we have we have we've covered that in, in our accounting playlist. Uh, but you you'll need more more support. You'll need maybe someone in house to support. Uh, uh, let's say you can hire someone part time, or you can outsource this. There's a lot of companies who do this uh, virtual, like a virtual or fractional CFO, fractional director of finance. You can have someone who can you give them all the receipts, everything throughout the month, and they can just do your your bookkeeping. So don't go cheap on accounting. Uh, hire someone early on. You don't have to hire them. You can just find a good bookkeeper. They'll probably spend two, three hours a week, a month maybe on your on your business initially, and then they can grow. They can give you, add more hours. They'll build you more, but they'll save you a whole lot of time. I can tell you that when we sold the last business and we had, we sold to Dentsu, the global media company, uh, part of the, there's a huge, long and, and very, very, uh, detailed oriented vetting process. Uh, the very first thing they did is they brought in PWC consultants and we sat in, I believe it was almost a full day, uh, where, where they looked at every line item. I mean, they prepared six, seven pages of questions about our book. So we gave them part of the due diligence, you know, we signed all the NDAs, all the non-disclosures and basically we gave them our accounting books, like everything, like access to our QuickBooks, basically. And they came back with, like I said, I don't know, maybe six pages of, of detailed questions about every transaction. And the good thing is three years before we sold the business or two years, we two and a half years, we actually had hired a, a, an accounting company and we had a fractional CFO, uh, Keith, who, who just came in and Angela and Keith, and they did an amazing job for us. They, in, in a couple of months, they they just made everything properly categorized. We're getting monthly reports. We, we start to look at forecasting. So we, there was the PwC consultants had no issues. There were no red flags, no yellow flags. Everything was in order. But the point here, and again, you might not be ready to sell your business. You're starting your business right now. But in the future, just an example, if we did not have our books in order, if the, 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 the PWC consultants would not have cleared this deal to go to the to the next step of due diligence. So so that investment that you have initially in your in your making sure your 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 books are organized and proper and you get in a monthly report has so many benefits. So keep that in mind as as you're building your business. Moving on, we have three more to go. Uh, so again, if you're just dialing in. Uh, we are covering the nine reasons why businesses, new businesses fail. A lot of the examples are services and consulting oriented, a lot of, but a lot of these ideas apply to all businesses. So, and again, if you have any comments, uh, please, uh, or questions, or you want to share your input or your own experience on, on, on these topics, please leave us a comment and I'll be more happy to, uh, to, to discuss it. We do have a question, so let me go to that before we go on point number seven. Do I need to form a business entity right away? A very good question. Short answer is no, but don't wait too long either. So if you're still in the business vetting phase, uh, the idea of vetting, you don't, need a, you don't need a business entity. But if you have, for example, some intellectual property, uh, you might want to have, again, speak with a lawyer to make sure you have protection, especially if you're talking to a lot of people about your idea. Um, if you are going to have a partner, a business partner or business partners, I think you want to get the lawyer, the lawyers involved sooner than later. Um, uh, if, if you, you can think of taxes, I know in this, the startup with Ferris business, to give you an example. So I started producing videos and we're sort of toying with the idea last year and I didn't have a business entity yet. And by the way, I did follow my own advice and I did have everything in a spreadsheet. And then we hired, rehired Angela <laughs> uh, to help us with our bookkeeping services. But I didn't start the, the, the legal entity. I did not set that up till, till I had a business partner 
and, and Eric and I went through that whole process that, that I described earlier. And just so you know, and again, this is maybe too much information, but uh, my business partner, Eric and I, I've, I've known him now for almost 10 years. We're, we're best friends and, and we, we worked together for a long time and we trust each other um, on, you know, on everything. But we did follow our own advice and we went to, to our attorney and we have, I think, like a 53-page document uh, on, on the partnership agreement. So um, not because I don't trust him or he doesn't trust me, but that's the right thing to do uh, because things happen in life and you want to be protected and you want your partner to be protected. So maybe uh, Eric um, loves working with me, but he does not want to work with my spouse if I happen to be hit by a bus. And so, so we have actually in that, business, in that partnership agreement, we have laid out all these scenarios, and again, with the help of the attorney, and laid, laid out how we would deal with them when they come up. So, so I think, uh, back to the question about the legal entity, you don't have to do it right away, but I would say don't wait too long uh, because you also, there's a liability aspect. Again, I'm not a lawyer, but, but when, you have, when you have a corporation, some of the liabilities will be you know, with, the, with, with the corporation, not with you as an individual. So I would say, as, as, as you're, if, you're, if you're taking the leap and you're starting, you wanna have a bank account and you wanna have, like you wanna have a business address, you don't have your home address, like all of that, having an entity, I think is, is very helpful. And again, you can start something very simple and then, then make it more elaborate in the future as your legal needs evolve. All right, good question. Thank you. Let's see if I have any other comments. All right. In terms, so point number seven, the reason number seven uh, for businesses to fail is, or why they fail, is not hiring A people. So, what's an A A A, a employee? Um, you'll you'll know them when you see them. But but having those initial hires. So you're a founder, you might have, again, a co-founder, and you're fully committed to this business. So the first people you hire are going to be important. So hiring a people is important, I think, throughout, throughout the growth of your business. It's essential, it is critical, you know, initially. If you hire someone where they don't share the same values that you have, let's say you have strong work ethic, you're, you're, you're very responsive to clients, and you have someone, you hire someone who's just the opposite. You know, they, th they take their time. They don't respond right away. I mean, you go, you know, they, 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 they're not thorough in their response. And you're going out selling and telling, hey, our company is big on responsiveness. And you've been very responsive during the sales process. And then you go and you sold something, your service, and you pass it on to your first employee to deliver that service. And they're the total opposite. They're not responsive your client's not gonna be happy. You set the wrong expectation with them. You, saw, you set the right, right expectation, but you're not delivering that expectation. So, so find, you know, hiring someone who's going to have the same values that you have, uh, who is going to, especially initially, think like, like an owner. And, and there's, we can talk about this in a different episode, a different live stream in terms of, in terms of people and hiring. But the point I wanna highlight here is at times you you're you're pressed to hire very quickly and and you you we hire sometimes without the proper interview pro proper you know reference checking and and then we need the help right away and that will come back and bite us i would say no matter how painful it is to to do more work and not not be able to 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 delegate to a new hire no matter how difficult it is do not rush hiring the right people because once you hire someone in a way yes you can fire them the next day whatever it's not a not a pleasant topic but but once you hire someone it takes for it takes a long time to onboard them to help them understand your business your services your clients and then three months down the road if they're not a good fit like what do you do we, okay you have to come up with a with an improvement plan and then let's give them another month or two and if they're not improving like it, it just it gets worse as 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 it, as time goes by. So so keep keep that in mind. Is don't rush to making that hiring, although you might need it. Make sure that you vet the folks, the people um, properly. And I think initially, 
a lot of the hires could come from your network. So when you get a resume, an online resume, or you know, maybe you see someone that you don't know, uh, you can interview their skill, you know, you can get a feel for their skills, where they're at, are they junior, mid-level, are they senior or expert? Um, you can probably ask a lot of questions and, and get a good feel about, again, the, the, the technical part of it. But if they happen to be a jerk, it's hard to find that out during the interview. So I would say initially, rely on your network i mean once once you grow and you need to hire like you know f five or ten people in the next quarter your network might not be sufficient for you to get the leads you know to hire uh, but initially i would say rely on people you know rely on people on, on your network to 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 vouch for these folks that you're about to hire i think that that would that would that would lower the risk of hiring the wrong person so that's one idea the other idea to keep in mind is, is that let's say I'll give you an example. If you if your consultancy is about you provide training or implementation or strategy around whatever the case might be, it could be you have a software, an accounting software that you build your consultancy around, you know, to support. It could be you provide a privacy data privacy consulting or maybe IT consulting. So yes, you have a software that you're maybe selling, reselling, or you're, you're supporting, remember, it's not all about the software. The, the people who are buying your services, the companies or the people who are buying your services, they're not just buying the software. They can buy the software from, from many vendors. They're buying from you because you're the consultant, you're the expert. And your team who is, again, training, implementing, supporting, maintaining the software, if they're not up to par, if they're not, again, they know their stuff really well and they're good with customers, um, and they're, again, they have, they believe in the same, they share the same values that you have. That's going to make, this is going to make things really difficult for you to, again, to, to, to keep the clients happy and, and obviously, uh, you know, grow the business. So keep, keep that in mind uh, as, as, as you're hiring. Again, budgets are going to be tight initially, but I'll give you, I'll give you an example before we go to the next point is I remember we were building a business abroad. And our business in the U.S. here was doing really well. And we figured, I figured we can use some of the profit from this business here to, uh, to support that new business. So, so ended up being tight here because we're taking some of the profit, profit and it was tight there abroad in the, abroad, in the business that we're set, setting up abroad because we had a limited budget. So for the first year, year and a half, we, we, we couldn't afford to hire top talent and someone senior and i mean the, the it was really expensive so we ended up hiring someone junior mid-level and they they i mean we were sort of stuck we had customers and we need someone to manage the delivery and we we made a decision where we hired someone and, and it wasn't a good fit again i don't want to talk about the specific individual it could have been that they were distracted they had a lot going on in their life but we 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 lost that one client. We couldn't grow the business. And then this person ended up leaving. And I think it took us, again, that's a year and a half to figure that out. And then we we had to make that investment and hired a senior person. And again, he shared the same values and very responsive. And and, and that is like a day and night in terms of keep making the clients happy, delivering, growing those accounts, brought in someone senior who could not just deliver but also can sense new opportunities so so that was he wasn't a founder at the time uh, but he felt like a founder and he worked hard and he believed in, in the vision and he's now he's been with us for almost eight years in this in this this one business I'm, that's i'm still involved in and and that that was that was that that initial sacrifice or that initial commitment to hire someone very senior and that was very expensive for us at the time but of course it paid off handsomely for us. And, and, and that's, again, it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing. Sometimes there's no cash. You might have to get a loan. You might have to be very creative. But investing in A people, hiring A people, will help you across the board. And one last thing is, and I heard this from someone. I don't think I mean I made this one up, but A people hire A people. B people hire C people. So when you hire A people, they, they're going to get you the next set of employees and the junior employees that we're going to get and train and coach and, and nurture 
you're gonna they were gonna get you more a people so so keep that in mind um, and don't don't go cheap on hiring and be creative in how you can compensate these senior people all right two more factors or reasons to that 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 cause startups and, and new businesses to fail before we go to number eight let me see if we have any questions we have someone from LinkedIn. Unfortunately, on my screen here, I don't see who the LinkedIn user is, but they say, thank you, Ferris. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much for, for your comment and for tuning in. If you have any, if you have any questions, please uh, please add it in the comments. I, I do see the comments from LinkedIn, but I don't see the, the name of the user. I will figure out a way to do it next time. I think I should have LinkedIn in the background as well. But we use the software that, that streams across many channels for efficiency purposes. All right. Number eight, not learning broadly and continuously. Uh, so um, learning is important. Uh, I think learners are earners, earners are learners, whatever that saying is, I believe in it both ways. Uh, but as a service provider, as a consultant, people are coming to you, clients are coming to you because you're an expert. And, and we talked about expertise being a spectrum. You don't have to be a guru to, to start a business. You can, if you know, if you know, 20, 30 percent more than everyone, everyone else. You can you can do a business. You can start a business around what you know. But people come to you because you are the expert. So so in this day and age, and in a lot of you know, there are very few services where there are no changes in technology or there are no um, you know new new things you have to ad, um, uh, ad, adopt and adapt to. So it's important for you as an entrepreneur, as an as a, as, a, as a consultant, as a service provider, when you go and out and meet clients, you have to you have to sort of it has to be sort of a second nature that that you convey that that credibility, you establish that authority um, that you are the man, you are the woman who like you mastered that domain, like you you you're, you're so good, you understand their problem and you anticipate the issues and you share with them what it is that that's causing them the pain or what is it that you know that that, that the needs their desires what is it that they're trying to accomplish so and i think to do that you can learn by doing and that's definitely definitely valid some of us just learn by doing um but but in addition i think what people say well i learn by reading i learn by experimenting i learn by watching yes and no i think to, to achieve mastery in anything you have to do it. You have to read about it. You have to engage in it. You have to listen about it. You have to speak with other experts. So I think this concept of learning is really important. And it's funny that sometimes we think we know stuff, and 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 we we you know it's easier the second time around, the third time around. But I'm on my seventh venture now, and this startup with 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 Ferris Venture I'll, again, maybe maybe too much information, but just just to get a sense of. You know, in terms of business planning, when we started the business, yes, we, we have a business plan. Maybe not as thorough as it should have been. Uh, but getting into, I guess, the creator economy, uh, having a YouTube channel, having a daily newsletter, and being out there uh, is, is something that we've dabbled with in, in the past. Um, we, we had, in, in one of the previous companies, we had an industry-leading blog. So in terms of producing content, no, no issue. We understand exactly what it takes to, to do that. But I can tell you, um, in, in again, in this case, learning this new space about how to be a creator on YouTube, how to properly set up uh, the, the daily newsletter, it took a whole lot of research. And then when, when we had our uh, initially intern, then, then an employee, I mean, all, all, all the entire team here, we were spending. I think I don't think I've I've watched as many YouTube videos I I did in that in that time frame. Like I think we dedicated almost eight ten weeks to just do thorough research, and and we listened to all these top creators on how they how they build their business. So so point here is, we can do a video on on the creator economy. But is even if you're a savvy business person, if you're successful. You'll probably be very good at certain aspects of the business, marketing, sales, operations, whatever the case might be. But the new venture that you're trying, don't, don't I guess, humble yourself and listen. I mean, I think there's a tendency for those of us who've been around for a long time, like, yeah, I know it. I figured it out. I'm an entrepreneur. I can move mountains. Yes to all of that. But if you're getting into a new vertical, you're getting 
getting into a new space, uh, you have to invest in learning. You have to spend the time, you and your team members, or if you have, again, if cash is not an issue, bring in subject matter experts who can help you expedite that learning. So learning by doing is, learning by doing is great. Learning with, from experts, with experts is very good. Learning, learning by watching, by reading is important. It has, but you have to put invest time in this learning so you can keep your edge. So you don't, you don't want to go to a client and they ask you a question and they know more about the service than you do. It's totally okay if they come to you with the questions that you're, you're not aware of, you know, you can go and research, but you want, you want to build up, you know, you want, you, you, if you want to master that domain and with mastery, I think comes um, a whole lot of, like the financial side will take, take care of, take care of your, of itself. You, you can demand a premium. If you're a consultant and you're really good at what you do, you can, you can charge, uh, I mean, your, your, your rates. I remember in one of the businesses, and this is the last example before I go to the next last point here, is that we were selling, uh, we were selling, uh, I think like at, at, at like one, 100, $125 an hour. And, and I thought that was, that was, and that was many years ago. And I think that was high. And then as, as we got to know this domain really well and, and had a number of clients under our belt and some, some amazing logos, Fortune 500, I mean, we doubled, we, we went to 250 an hour in a span of a few months. Once, once we felt we understood that space really well. So, so learning and mastering and, and, and reading at night and watching, not just Mr. Beast videos, but watching <laughs> educational videos on YouTube uh, will help you get that edge and maintain it and, and will help you, you know, in terms of selling at a premium. All right. So. Before we go to the ninth reason and the last reason here for today, let me see if we have any questions. Will you have the money to hire a people if you're just starting up? Uh, so I, I, I believe I addressed this just maybe a few minutes ago, but I guess in case if you're just dialing in, in most cases you, you won't. Uh, it's it's difficult. Um, again, again, I'm assuming if you're starting a business, you set a budget aside for the business. So in that budget that you set aside, even if if you're bootstrapping, just make sure you you put some some money for for, for in your financial plan, for, you know, for hiring, and make sure you understand the market, as, you know, segment uh, that you're in, and 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 the salaries and the compensation, you know, in the market where you want to hire. What I would say as an entrepreneur, one of the traits that you have to have uh, develop is res resourcefulness. So this is where creativity comes into the picture. So initially, and again, in one of my ventures now, uh, we are dealing with the situation where we don't need, not, it's not about affordability, we don't need someone full time. So the creative part, how can, how can I find a senior person in, in their field who can work with us for maybe 10 to 15 hours a week. That's a challenge. So same thing. And then we found, well, maybe if someone is wants to work remote and someone maybe is taking, taking a leave or maybe someone taking a paternity or a maternity leave and, and they can, they can, they only have 10, 15 hours a week. That would be, that would be a perfect fit for us. So I think have being creative in the way you think of compensation. I think if you have a vision, you believe in it and you have some traction, if you go to folks in the right time, you might find someone who's working at a Fortune 500 and they're just sick and tired of the red tape and working for a big company. And now they want to come in and work in a less stressful, I guess, red, less red tape. I shouldn't say less stressful. Sometimes small companies can be stressful. But let's say they just want to leave corporate. So you can, that might be a, the right person for you. And maybe you can't match what they're getting paid, but you can come, come up with an arrangement. You can say, I'll pay you this now. And as we get as we get more revenue and more profit, as we get more profitable, I will increase and I, maybe I will, I'll, you know, we can pay you back what we're not compensating for, you know, now. So again, I think if people, if you have that vision and you believe in it and you're working hard and you have some traction and, and, and you can find people in so many different ways where their life situation at that point works really well, like it matches your need. I remember here, um, one example is in our industry, someone who was here in the Bay Area and I was at a networking event and he was working for a big company and making really good money, 
and uh, and he, he needed to go and relocate because he wants to be close closer to his parents they're they're getting older and at that time this is way before covid this is way before remote work and i talked to him and i said well we're not hiring but if we were hiring i would definitely hire you because i've known him from the industry he's an amazing guy he's still a good friend now and when i went back to the office the team said oh my goodness he met he met his name is John. Uh, so he said, met John, and, and I told him, and he said, oh, my God, we should hire him. I said, folks, we don't have the budget to hire John. He's senior. We can't afford him. But that he was he was known in our circles, and he's really a really good guy. So, so long story short, I talked to John, and we worked something out. And we were I was very open. I was very transparent about where we are financially. And I said, if you're going to be working remote, will support that. And this was like 2014, way before COVID. And actually we were one of the very first companies who pioneered this, this work, remote work. And, and you know, we, we, it was working out really well for us. And that's a subject for another live stream maybe. But the point is being out there, you know, with a vision and I showed him that, you know, we're, 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 we were small at the time, but we had a small team, but we were doing really well. We started to attract big companies and his expertise would work really out for, for us. So, so, so they say, you know, luck comes to the prepared. So if if we if we did not have some traction, and if I didn't happen, to, if I didn't make the effort to travel from San Jose, from Santa Clara to San to go to San Francisco, an hour and a half, and be at that networking event, and be at that event and talk to to John, this this good luck would not have taken place. So long story short, I think you can be creative in the way you structure your compensation. You can be creative in in how you, and maybe you do bonuses and, and how you attract talent in different maybe localities, but there there are ways to do it. All right, uh, but good, good question. Again, a lot of these could be subjects for future live streams. The ninth and last reason, at least for today's uh, live stream is on why, why businesses fail is not recognizing when to pivot, you know, miss, missing that pivot window. Now, I think you can think of pivoting um, you can pivot toward to, toward a new opportunity, or you can pivot away from mistakes. So pivoting away from mistakes, I think, is easier. We get a client, we lose a client because we're not responsive. Okay, we should be more responsive, right? I'm pitching um, uh, my service at uh, $5,000 a month, and nobody's buying. Maybe if I make it 4000 or maybe I show my, credibility, my, my credentials or I package it differently, I can sell. So those, you can pivot, make those small changes. But there are significant moments, I think, in a business where you need to make a, a big pivot. We have to just the whole business line is not working for now. It used to be working. Uh, we used to have good margins. There were not as many competitors. We're enjoying that ride. And all of a sudden, we can't sell. Our competitors are cutting, like cutting their prices by half, whatever the case might be. So sometimes you have to make these big decisions to pivot the whole business or a, a line of business. And it is not easy, uh, but if you don't do it, I mean, it's at your own peril. And, 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 and again, those are very tough decisions. And I, usually those might not happen like right away in a business. But I think if you're vetting different ideas and you tried a few of them and, and, and one of them is not working, you can pivot away from that. If you're like a year or two in your business and you have a, a line of business now and you have revenue, but, but you, you're not profitable. I mean, I, I know founders who who selling really good at selling, and they've been going at it for a year or so, a year, year and a half, and they have a nice now a revenue stream, but they're not not profitable. So you have to then pivot, find why is it that you're not profitable, and pivot away from that. An example from one of our businesses, we were selling to small businesses, and and we had a nice this is nice uh, recurring uh, business model where it was like. 200 300 dollars a month from from a whole lot of businesses and as we got better at our craft and as we got some certifications from from one of our providers and became a, a known pa partner we started to attract the fortune 500. it did not happen overnight but we we got there so now i'm looking at by by doing some research i'm i'm seeing people charging for for a retainer a 12-month retainer Two thousand, three thousand, five thousand dollars a month, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm drooling now. Oh my God! I have these clients where I'm selling, you know, my services at at two hundred dollars an hour, 
uh, sorry, at, at $200 a month, now I can sell a whole lot more services for one client, less headache, less paperwork. I can focus on a few clients. So we did make that decision to pivot away from the small businesses, the SMB, small and sized businesses, and, and, and reorient our business to serve the enterprise. We had to up, upgrade our messaging, our website, all that. So, you know, the logos. The hardest part was, the hardest part was to letting go of these small businesses, especially those businesses that that were with us from day one. Some of them like support us from when, when we were very small. So I knew some of the business owners, you know, I sold to them and they've been with us for a few years. So what we ended up doing is I found a business part. I found an industry friend who, who were focused on selling to the SMBs. And then I went to each one of those clients and I said, we love you, we love your business. Don't take this the wrong way, but we are, we are now in a different phase and we can't really support you. We, we don't have the processes or we're not focused on SMVs. And I think we might have sent a gift to each client, but we made an introduction to my good friend, Kevin at the time. And we, there was Kevin and there's Tom, local uh, friends here who are consultants in the same space. And we, we passed on that business to, to Kevin and Tom. And we didn't get any cut. We didn't get any. It was they were good friends of mine. I wanted them, I wanted to make sure that took, they took care of our clients, and and that was that was really important to me. But it was really hard. Letting go of revenue is really hard, but that made a huge difference because now we're focused on the enterprise. We're focused on on Fortune 500. We don't have to like we're we're, we're focused on on and preparing for the pitch and going in there and be you know, having the slide deck and. And, and bringing our expertise, showing off our expertise, like it's a different different mindset, different delivery, different way of packaging. And, and we had that background before I started the first startup, I was in corporate and I was selling to Fortune 500. So naturally that was, that was, that was just easy for me and my, my, my co-founder uh, co to do. So, so I think recognizing when to pivot is important. Again, it comes with experience. It, I think it comes with speaking with experts. You don't, you don't want to pivot too early and leave money on the table or leave like you don't want to you don't want you don't want to uh, leave an idea before you've committed to it and 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 sort of lose all that investment time and money into that idea but also at the same time you don't want to wait too long and and stick to something that's just not going to get any revenue so so those are some things to to keep in mind and and I remember this maybe last example. Let me see if you have any questions before we wrap it up. I think maybe. Yeah, we we can. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe we pause here to see if it, there's a question before we go to the example. But you know, I, I've done it in 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 a business where we invested, hired two people, invested, you know, their salaries and and to to promote. Um, the marketing and and of, of their service of that service that line of business that new line of business we wanted to start, but after six months we were getting zero traction. We we had mis miscalculated the need in the market, and unfortunately after all that investment, you can imagine this was Silicon Valley, two people full time, uh, with with all the support, including the 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 mental bandwidth to dedicate to this new initiative. We had to shut it off after six months. Now, the good thing is these were good people. It wasn't their fault. So we did not fire them. We found something else for them to do in our business. And they did amazingly well after that. So it wasn't them. It was just we mistimed, miscalculated the timing for that service. So those, again, those are things, um, sometimes not easy decisions. And then there's no scientific formula in my mind or something I've come across to do. It's something that you, you learn, again, by experiencing and you learn by asking others. At the end of the day, what if... None of this is working. You know, you're trying your best. You're learning from these pitfalls. You're avoiding these pitfalls. You're learning from the mistakes of others. You're learning from your own mistake. You know, they say you either, you know, double down or shut down. At, at one point, after you've you've doubled down, you've committed, you pivoted, you tried. If if it doesn't work, maybe it's time to call call quits and do something different. Maybe go back to corporate find a business partner, like I, learn from that experience and do, do something, something different. Or sometimes it's just life. I mean, life, things happen. Who expected, a huge, you know, that, that shutdown during, you know, during COVID? Who expected maybe like if you happen to be in a, in a war zone uh, area, if you, were, if you had a software development company in, in Ukraine selling, you know, 
selling to to let's say to folks companies here in in the U.S. and then the war took place. So so things could happen outside. It could be a natural disaster. It could be so many external factors. The economy sometimes things beyond our control. So you want to be agile. You want to be able to pivot. You want to be able to do things differently. But at times you have to call it quits, and then you learn from that. And it's totally okay to to um, to feel to feel terrible about it initially, maybe to to cry about it, to, but don't agonize for a long time. You know, it's 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 just part of life. Life is not perfect. I don't think life is meant to be perfect. We learn from it and we move on. So that is that is it for today. Hope you found this this content, this 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 these nine reasons why startups fail useful. And if you do, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel. We have these weekly live streams. We have other videos on all the topics that founders um, uh, run into or issues run into and how to solve them, how to address them. And don't forget to sign up with the Daily Advisor, our newsletter dedicated to you, the founder, the new business owner who is who's eager to learn and, 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 and grow their business. And thank you again for tuning in. Next live stream is on Wednesday. It's every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10, 10, 10 a.m. Pacific. See you then.